many of you know this, uh, if you've been graduate students here or are now, you know, we have strict rules <laughs> that graduate students are absolutely not allowed to do any sort of consulting or outside uh, creative work, writing books, uh, organizing film festivals, all of that, because, of course, being a graduate student is a full time job. And uh, we also have a, a long tradition of ignoring rules. <laughs> you know, you're going to strip my diploma? When he, you know, when, so in, uh, you know, with a matter of weeks, it seemed, after finishing uh, PhDs, uh, Boris Hoffman and Hans de Peiner uh, had somehow put together a company. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm sure most of you know the story, but I'll, 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 I'll just repeat it, unless I'm spoiling your... No, uh, okay. Uh, I, I mean, the, the thrill of it for those of us that are far away is that they succeeded so well that they kind of made it on this, um, uh, onto this geeky stage, which is to be, uh, actually, I think the only vendor that was invited to, to the Apple keynote talk at a Worldwide Developers Conference. And are, are you going to tell them about this? Well, I will. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, I don't want to spoil any more. And the six weeks in the Apple dungeon before. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, it's very exciting to have him back, and, um, and uh, congratulations on your great success, and uh, thanks for coming, and please join me in uh, welcoming Boris back to his Carnegie Mellon. Thank you. Hi, it's really a pleasure to be back. I, I wasn't really sure uh, when I was putting together this talk what to focus on, because there was a piece of it that's kind of an interesting story that um, uh, that is fun to share, and then there's a piece of it that is kind of the technology breakdown of the product itself, which I, I think some people would find um, pretty neat. Um, and then the other part of it is just kind of some of the lessons learned, um, uh, some uh, thankfully not through kind of hard mishaps and some uh, through uh, some painful uh, mishaps. But uh, I, I think you know, the best way to approach it is a combination of all of them. So I kind of slapped together a talk that hits on all three of those categories. Um, it, you'll, you'll notice it's a little bit piecemeal. Um, there's some elements that have one style, some elements that have another. Um, and I figured I'd uh, cover a little bit of everything, and then we'll leave some time for questions. And if there's anything that's uh, particularly interesting, we can dive into more detail. Uh, so I am uh, I'm Boris. So I'm one of the founders of Anki. Uh, and, um, uh, I graduated um, from the Robotics Institute in 2010, in the fall of 2010, and I actually uh, have an even longer history at CMU, so I did my undergrad here, so I paid my, my dues. I did my decade in Pittsburgh, uh, where I started in 2001, did, was in the ECE and CS departments, and then stayed on board um, after I became a, uh, um, a lowly undergrad minion for some grad students in Tony Stence's lab. Um, and, and, and then five, six years later, I uh, had a PhD as well. But it was a really wonderful time. And so I wanted to, I guess, start by sharing a little bit about my project. So I, I worked on Crusher. This was uh, um, probably about half or two thirds of my PhD work came through this. Um, and uh, a lot of you guys are familiar with it. It's a big off-road vehicle. My focus was on machine learning techniques um, to allow it to improve its performance in real time, uh, to train itself during a run, um, to improve its perception system, be able to deal with the environment better. Um, that was a really fun project. Uh, we'd, we'd send it all over the country. Um, and uh, I was one of probably, I don't know, maybe like uh, 12 people, 15 people on the project or so. So we had a variety of grad students, variety of uh, NREC staff. Um, it was a pretty fascinating project. And then uh, when that got taken away, um, uh, we, we went to work on the um, uh, glorified golf cart. Uh, that was the, the Gator. And so then Dave Silver and I had to uh, sit down for months uh, and get that thing up to shape uh, in order to be able to continue doing some research and finish off the PhD. And so my, uh, my thesis in the end, um, uh, I was co-advised by Tony and Drew, and it was pretty fascinating to be able to uh, both work on and be exposed to all these really amazing technologies um, uh, around me. And I think Mark and uh, Mark Paltucci and Hans Depiner, my two co-founders, felt the same way, where Mark was more uh, pure machine learning focus, Hans was in haptics um, and remote bomb disposal. And in the end, one of the realizations we had is that there's all this incredible technology out there. And um, it went from being heavily government uh, funded, where the focus was defense, space, um, kind of pure research. Uh, there started to be a lot of applications in industrial and um, uh, kind of commercial agricultural fields. Um, but very little was making it into consumer products. And so that's where um, our, uh, our attention kind of shifted to. We wanted to, um, 
to take these technologies that were, um, that were exposed to in the lab and actually apply them to mass market consumer products where we could have a big impact. So we spent a lot of time thinking about the areas we could focus on and decided on entertainment. Um, so when you think about phys uh, entertainment, physical entertainment, uh, first thing that comes to mind is toys. And this is an industry that is probably one of the most stagnant in industries you can probably imagine. Um, not much has changed from today to the toys that I played with to the toys that people played with in the 60s and 70s. It's the same kind of core form factor. They'll, they'll reskin them, they'll have like small uh, subtle tip tricks and, uh, uh, and gimmicks that'll make them more appealing. But at the end of the day, um, that's an industry that hasn't really evolved too much. But at the same time, there's a really powerful uh, uh, attachment that people have to physical things. So things they can hold and touch and collect, name, share with a friend. You can't really replicate that on a screen. But at the same time, when you do go on a screen, um, in video games, we're used to some pretty amazing things. You have characters that evolve, you have worlds that expand, uh, you have rules, structure, you have real adaptability where the game you start playing with on day one is completely different from the game you play in the second week or the second month. And probably the biggest thing that, um, that's easy to take for granted is the fact that in the video game, there's usually many characters. And whether it's humans controlling them or the game, it's that interaction between those characters that creates this diversity of situations that keeps things fun uh, and engaging. But um, at the same time, all of that is trapped on a screen. And any time anybody's tried to take that into physical form, they've lost the magic and soul of what makes these uh, gameplay elements uh, so special in a video game. And so we decided to try to do something that nobody else had ever done before. And uh, that was to create this new category of entertainment at this intersection of toys, video games, and mobile devices where we could do something really special. And that is to literally program video games on top of physical characters in the real world and combine the elements of both of those. Uh, and a big uh, element of that made it possible is the hardware landscape, where even five years earlier, this would have been completely impractical, but now suddenly there were components that were very low cost, high performance, um, very prevalent, driven by the cell phone market largely. Smart devices were becoming almost a commodity, where you had this amazing computer interface device, it was web connected, and you could do some really special things. On the component side, um, each of our cars, I'll, uh, I'll share later, has a 50 megahertz computer inside of it. And that's pretty amazing considering that that computer, that chip costs about a dollar to $1.20. dollar 20. Um, and that's something that is uh, uh, pretty mind blowing because my first computer was a 33 megahertz and that's after you push the turbo button and that was uh, $2,500 if I remember correctly. So um, things have really changed and the same thing goes for, um, uh, for cameras, for batteries, for everything else. Um, and so, we set out to do this, and um, Matt, uh, close your eyes. Uh, that's a typo, it's actually 2010. Um, <laughs> and so this was uh, us in the early stages. We were in um, uh, figurative garage mode, literal living room mode. Um, and this is how we spent many nights, weekends, um, avoiding our thesis and um, doing uh, things that grad students shouldn't be doing. Um, and uh, we were working on the early kind of foundations, um, trying to figure out a way to have these physical characters be able to understand their environment and to be able to come to life. Very, uh, in the very early phases, it was almost like a real world SimCity that we wanted to build and to create this immersive um, um, uh, behavior that was not possible in physical form. And so um, I graduated at the end of 2010. Um, Mark graduated uh, maybe six months later. Um, uh, so I was October 2010. He was maybe like March or April 2011. And Hans has been one month from, gradu uh, from graduating um, for about four years now, three years now. So he left in uh, May uh, 2011, and um, he had written 60 pages of his thesis, I believe. And um, he still, Ralph owes you another, uh, another 60 or so. Um, so one, one solid month of work, and I think he'll be done, right? I think he has four more years to defend, if I remember uh, correctly. So um, we're pushing him. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're, uh, he's on it. We're, we're going to cut him out of the office, change, it, change the key cards until he's done. Um, so uh, with uh, 2.95 PhDs, we um, uh, decided in 2011 to, uh, to move to San Francisco. And so we left. Um, uh, this, this was in May 2011. This was, I think, the winter before. And so we uh, decided to leave Pittsburgh and uh, shift over to uh, sunny California. Um, Pittsburgh doesn't always look like that, and California doesn't always look like this. But... Um, it's a good, good generalization. Um, and uh, we, um, uh, we set up an office, a uh, tiny little cubicle office where uh, there's just the three of us. Uh, we had a person join us. Um, we closed a seed round of funding in 2010 and 11. We raised a Series A. We continued um, 
working through everything. And so what I wanted to show is a product video for, um, for Anki Drive to just kind of cut to the end and then we'll come back and kind of go through it again. This is actually something that is um, not finished yet. It's a video that we're producing right now that's an update to our old one. Um, and it's about a week and a half from finishing, so there's still some raw elements to it. But um, I figured I'd, I'd share um, because I thought it was um, it's a pretty neat one. And this will give you an idea of what the product actually is if you haven't seen it. Little intense for dramatic effect, and uh, still some CG missing, but gives you the idea. It's a racing game, but it's physical. Um, uh, but it's like it's a battle racing game in the real world. You have cars that are uh, customizable. You can upgrade them. You upgrade the engine on your car. It physically drives faster. You give it a new weapon. You can use it in the game. Uh, in whichever cars you don't control, um, they're controlled by the artificial intelligence in the game. They drive themselves and they compete against you. And so if there's two of us playing, we could have four cars where the other two react to what you're doing, what I'm doing, what the other ones are doing. And it's like playing um, like a Mario Kart, uh, a grittier Mario Kart in the real world. Um, and that is, uh, uh, it's something that is, um, uh, to make that happen, it's a robotics problem. And in the end, you have to solve uh, some pretty core principles. So now zoom back to uh, 2000. Uh, 2008, 2009, we started thinking about how to actually make something like that possible where um, you need to solve some pretty fundamental problems in, in robotics. And so the way we think about it is, uh, is this system and this platform that uh, allows us to solve these core problems in positioning, localization, reasoning, execution. So the characters need to know where they are. They need to know the situation around them. Reasoning is thinking about that information, making intelligent decisions. Execution means they have to be able to do it precisely in the real world. And um, you, you all know better than anybody else that these aren't new problems in robotics. Uh, people have been looking at them for decades and uh, in every permutation with different types of constraints. But the hardest part for us wasn't just solving these problems, but actually doing it at a price point and reliability that makes sense for a consumer product. So Anki Drive is on sale for $199 for the base set and then additional characters are 69. That means that you can't use expensive uh, components, sensors, computation. You can't have a fixed environment. It has to, be, it has to work everywhere that, um, that you need it to work. And so we had to really rethink how we approached, um, uh, approached these problems. And so let's say you have these uh, fine looking cars in the real world and you want them to behave intelligently and completely on their own. So let's say you want that car in the rear to be able to pass the other two cars. So first thing you need is positioning. So that car needs to understand where it is and where the other ones are relative to it. Um, and there's a lot of ways that people have solved local positioning, localization, use, use that interchangeably. Um, if we were in a lab here, you might have a, um, a room with high definition, high definition cameras mounted on the ceiling. Some poor grad student calibrates all of them and then you do motion tracking relative to these cars on the ground. And, um, You'd get millimeter precision, it would work perfectly well, but you'd uh, spend thousands of dollars in equipment, you'd have to have a dedicated room and a grad student that doesn't scale to a mass producible product. So that doesn't work too well. Um, we're able to do localization um, on, uh, rolled out in any environment with just a handful of dollars worth of components. And so once you have this positioning information, reasoning means uh, using that information to make intelligent decisions. And this is exactly what the cars, how the cars are actually thinking about what's happening in their game. It's like a game of chess where they're thinking about what they're going to do, what the other ones are going to do in return, and back and forth, except that all of this is happening uh, and we're considering thousands of potential actions for all the cars and we're doing it on mobile devices. And so all of that is abstracted away where the brains for all the cars are actually in whatever mobile devices are running the game. And so that means we can start doing some pretty sophisticated planning that would not be possible locally on board a car. Once you have an intelligent plan, you gotta be able to execute it. And now this becomes hard again, as you guys know, because you gotta deal with the real world. There's slip, there's 
dust, there's physics, um, there's all of the things that make this a nasty problem. And again, you don't have the benefit of high-end uh, uh, motors or precision. This has to all be done in a very cost-effective way. Um, and uh, we were able to actually solve the, um, the precision of driving part um, really, really well, where um, since we're geeks at heart, we actually did the math and scaled it up to real world size. Um, if you were to scale up the driving performance of those cars at peak, it would be the equivalent of you driving your car 250 miles an hour down the highway with a concrete wall a tenth of an inch from each of your mirrors on either side and staying within that wall. So that's how precisely these cars are able to maneuver around their trajectory at peak performance. Um, so, each of these problems on their own were really, really hard and really fascinating, but the powerful thing is what happens when you combine the three of them, the positioning, the reasoning, the execution. That's when you can do something really powerful, and that's to just abstract away everything that's physical and just treat these characters as if, as if they were just virtual characters in a video game. And now all of a sudden, you can take all of those things that we love about video games, the adaptability, the uh, character progression, the rules, the structure, the interaction, and literally program, program them on top of these physical characters in the real world. And so our first product is Anki Drive, and this is, uh, this is the base set. Um, it went on sale in, um, uh, in October, uh, uh, late October of last year, um, in every Apple store in North America, so we're in the US and Canada. Um, and also on our website. Um, and so before I dive into a little more detail on how it works technically, um, I figured I'd start at a high level very abstractly. So what actually is happening to make this work is that each car is not completely thinking on its own. One of the devices in the game is a central state. It's hosting the game. And so let's say there's three players, there's five cars, a few of them are AI controlled cars. There's a central state in the phone where there's a video game going on inside the phone and we're synchronizing it to the physical world. So the robotics and the AI aspects are what makes the physical and the virtual match and sync up. Um, that's transparent to you. So if you're player two, you're actually controlling that car uh, that's labeled player two, but you're relaying that information through another phone. And what that, why that's important is because we have a place where there's a central state. We can model all the uncertainty. We can deal with um, weapons, with ammo, with damage, with all the things that make this possible. And in the end, what happens is that all the things that are computationally intensive get offloaded to the mobile device where computation is more plentiful and the cars are responsible for very low level behavior. So they're responsible for positioning, for understanding where they are, for, for motion control. But all the reasoning and planning is actually happening on a phone where you actually have much more time to make those decisions. And so if you were to strip down a car, um, it's actually a variety of components and they're all fairly commodity components. So the five major components in the car are a microcontroller, 50 megahertz um, uh, arm chip, uh, a Bluetooth low energy module, a uh, optical sensor, a battery and two motors for the rear wheel. So it's a differential steer vehicle. Um, and each of those are about a dollar uh, per component. Um, and that is one of the most important things to making this low cost at a high, high scale. What that also means is that there's a lot more complexity on the software side to make all that work and that's uh, part of the intention from the very beginning. And so um, this kind of touches on one of the core uh, philosophies of how we approach this from the very beginning is that in order to be at a reasonable price point and mass producible, the hardware needs to be as simple and elegant as possible. It doesn't mean it was easy to get to, but it's gotta be very, very simple in terms of components and uh, range of uh, a margin of error in terms of, in terms of what it needs. And instead, we want to push all the complexity into the software side where we have much more control and we can build a lot of value and continue to, to iterate past the actual shipment of the product. When you uh, look at the um, wireless capabilities of this, one of the most important pieces was actually the Bluetooth Low Energy. So this is a um, relatively new, it's a new Bluetooth standard that just came out fairly recently. And what makes it very different from regular Bluetooth is that it is much, much better suited for multi-node networks and for um, uh, reliable and consistent latency. So your bandwidth is much smaller, but instead you get very low power consumption, you get very low latency, and more importantly, that variation of latency being very low is something that helps a lot with robotic systems because in a lot of cases, you don't mind if there's latency as long as you know what it is so you can actually model it in the right way. And so the, this, um, uh, this advance in, um, in wireless communications that Apple embraced really, really well is something that's in every one of their products starting with the iPhone 4S approximately, including the iPod Touch 5 and um, the uh, iPad 3. Uh, it's one of the things that made that platform so reliable. And so we literally have uh, cases where 
a mobile device is connecting simultaneously to three other iOS devices and three, four, five physical characters all at once. And so that device is juggling seven or eight real-time connections and doing all of that on board and not dropping a single beat. Um, and that's one of the reasons why um, Apple, just as a company, got really excited about it because it was the intention behind going to Bluetooth because it was just much more suited for long-term use and for um, interesting applications in the real world. And nobody had done something like that before. And it was actually really challenging because you start dealing with, um, with a lot of uh, interesting constraints when, um, uh, when you actually start to uh, try to build these systems in, uh, in noisy environments. So then the optics themselves, um, each car has a camera that looks downwards and the way they localize is that the track is actually uh, special. It's rollable and it's printed but it uses special kinds of ink and optics tricks. And so that is effectively a front facing camera of an iPhone, costs about a dollar again and it's incredibly high, uh, high performance because of the fact that there are hundreds of millions of iPhones in circulation. Um, it's a sort of sensor that uh, five, six years ago probably would have been prohibitively expensive, but suddenly we're able to use this incredibly high, um, high performance sensor for really low cost. And so the way it actually works is that the track itself is printed with a special kind of ink where we use optics tricks where it's transparent in the infrared spectrum. And so the car can see right through the upper layer and see everything that's underneath, which gives it uh, information about where it is, how it's driving, in effect, it's like a wine following robot, except there is no physical line that it has to follow. We can virtualize any line we want using uh, logic on the car. So it senses this track 500 times a second. It uses it to adjust its steering, minor adjustments to the rear, rear wheel motors, and simultaneously it sends back its positioning information to the phone that's running the game, maybe twice a second or so. And so meanwhile on the phone is where we actually do all of the grunt work. We do the localization, we do estimation of positions and uncertainty, we do um, the planning, the UI, the game layer, all of the things that actually make the game possible. Um, and in the end, that in very intentional split in complexity between the phone uh, and the cars is what makes this scale in terms of performance at a really low price point. And so it's, um, and it's again one of those things that um, when we started in 2008, you couldn't actually make an iPhone app. And so the original intention was to have a little embedded computer that runs, uh, serves that purpose with a little remote control. But in 2011, it became blatantly obvious that this was um, a really key part of the future of these sort of products. And so we made a shift, which wasn't that significant, to embrace it. And instead of a little embedded, um, uh, embedded computer, we had a much better computer for zero cost um, and didn't have to provide a controller. So that was a really big plus. And so, I figure one of the things that's, that's, um, that's probably pretty interesting um, is the actual mass production process. Um, and so there's a video that is uh, uh, not terribly polished because it was taken by one of our mechanical engineers at our, um, at our manufacturing facility, but it shows a little bit of the process of, of um, how these cars are actually made um, uh, at a large scale. Because in the end, one of the things that became very apparent is that going from a single prototype or five prototypes to then going to a mass production where you can make tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of cars, that's where the real challenge uh, happened because suddenly you have to uh, abide by constraints, um, make things that are injection moldable, you have to have strict testing procedures to be able to filter cars that are, um, that are not operating in the right way, um, and you have to design in a way that uh, takes into account um, variability in components, variability in environments, and how components might degrade over time. And so this is, um, there we go. All right. So this is a little bit of the process of both how the tools are made and how the actual boards um, uh, are made and then how those tools are used to make the plastics and how everything's combined. So on the circuit board, all of the components are actually loaded uh, by machines. Everything is uh, incredibly precise and it's tested. Make sure that there are, are no shorts. Um, these machines are pretty incredible at how fast they can, um, uh, they can pump out boards. This is all in China, uh, uh, in uh, 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 slightly north of uh, Hong Kong, uh, where these are made. And so these are the circuit boards. They're automatically um, uh, made, they're cut. Um, and then the encoders are for the wheels. So the, some of the things are manual, some of the things are automated. So the wheels are hand soldered. These are the tools. So they're big metal um, uh, molds that are, uh, that are created so that then um, things can be mass produced by just injecting them with plastic. And so when you want to make tens of thousands of pieces of plastic, instead of you would not 3D print, you would not CNC mill, you would make tools like this. And then 
uh, inject them with plastic, the plastic cools and um, you pop out the exact shape um, that you want every single time. So this was the uh, tool for um, the body of the car itself. And so we had tools for the body, we had tools for the shells, we had tools for the wheels, um, and every one of these was, uh, can be used a certain amount of time before they start to degrade. This was the actual assembly. This is one of the cars. Um, the painting process also prescribed set of steps where there'd be a series of masks where one part would get painted and another part would get painted. And um, all of this was meticulously designed so that then once we, once we turned on the manufacturing line, um, we could make uh, uh, thousands of cars a day on a single line. And, uh, and then you can uh, ramp up multiple lines to uh, paralyze it. And so then as these cars started um, getting put together, they go through a series of um, te test checkpoints. Uh, there'd be a test for the optics, there'd be a test for the wireless where the car would self-diagnose itself to see if it's working, make sure the lens is, uh, uh, is pointing in the right direction, that there's no, uh, there's no, no cracks and nothing's wrong. Um, the wheels would test themselves to make sure the encoders are working. Um, and, uh, and then before any car would ever get put into circulation, there'd be a full system test that's done where they would go through a pre predetermined series of steps and they would measure um, the variability in its wobble and, um, uh, and its speed control. Um, and at the end of this test, they would stop and they'd either flash a red light or a green light. And if it didn't flash the right light, they would not be able, they would not be active. They wouldn't be alive and they, they couldn't pack them out and send them. So then each one's uniquely labeled. And so we track these cars all the way from production through use where we know exactly how, how they're used um, for the entirety of their lifetime. That's the box pack out. So the track itself was actually made in the US. So we have four different printing facilities in the US where we made the track because um, we needed a very large scale printer with special kinds of silk screen printing technologies. And um, it was uh, something that um, we, didn't, uh, we weren't comfortable with the level of quality that we were getting in China at the time. And so we ended up printing in the US. Um, and then everything was shipped to our fulfillment center in Los Angeles and the final units were kitted where the box and all the plastics and cars and everything else would come from China and the tracks would come from our uh, printers in the US. And then the last step would be them being kitted and then we have finished units that either go to customers or to retailers. And so um, very different sort of thought process than we had to go through when we were actually making the prototypes. Um, and uh, also requires a very different type of um, skill set where we, had, we found some really amazing people that, um, that were able to uh, to make sure that we did a really good job on this. Um, and one of the lessons here is that you want those people internally. So we were happy that we did this from the beginning. Um, we had a mechanical engineer who you'll see in a little bit. Um, he has been doing mechanical engineering longer than I've been alive. So he's a, an old soul. So he was the first lead mechanical engineer at Logitech where he has um, more experience designing low cost, high reliability consumer products than anybody I could ever imagine. And so he has about half a billion um, units in circulation of my steering wheels, joysticks. And so um, he was in a really good position to um, help us with the cars. And so uh, the, the end result was that they're almost indestructible where uh, Hans at one point dunked it in a water, put it in a sock, threw it in a dryer. They bounced around for like uh, 20 minutes and then he put on a track and it still ran. And so, uh, and that's just the start of the abuse that he put him through. I think he threw him downstairs out, uh, out windows. And so um, the cars are, are, are fairly indestructible. And I think a big part of that is that the mechanical engineering design that you would do for a prototype is vastly different than what you would do for a mass produced product because you got to know um, where are the weak points, how would it break, what are the things that could go wrong. Um, so the other thing that's pretty fascinating about what we're, um, the system that, uh, that's, that's running on, um, on these cars is that we know everything that's happening in software. Um, we're logging everything. We know how people are using it. We know uh, how many clicks it took them in the UI to get to the game. We know how far the cars drove. We know uh, how far they got upgraded. We know the sort of games they played with it. And we know the win-loss records. And so you can get some pretty amazing uh, statistics that can influence a lot of parts of the business. So for example, we know that um, as of now, uh, we've had about 80 million laps driven worldwide of cars, uh, of Anki Drive cars um, all over the world. We can get statistics like this, where this is um, the type of games that people have played over the course of time. So this is split up into um, 
human-only games at the bottom. The dark blue is um, a mixture of multiple humans and AI. The green bar is games that include one human and all AI characters. And then the white at the top is a tutorial and onboarding that's purely AI. And so this means that over half of games being played um, involve AI-controlled cars. And it's kind of fascinating because you can start looking at trends where when we launched, it was a pretty uh, like less social. You see how cyclical it is on weekends and so forth. Then you see Thanksgiving take a really big spike as families get together, people play together. You have a lot more human uh, or multiple human games. And then uh, everybody goes to the corners and we come back down uh, and we peak again in December uh, when we get to close to Christmas and families get together again and start playing. And you see um, uh, parents and kids playing, um, uh, uncles and uh, relatives get together. And then suddenly school begins and you see the usage plummet and it's back to the AI again. And so these are the sort of things that are pretty fascinating. And we're not even sure what's, what's necessarily better. Is it better that people are using the AI or do we want to encourage social play? But just the fact that we can collect this sort of information means that we can influence it. Um, another really fun example is um, uh, these are uh, use clusters. So that is a unique user. So each dot there is a unique device. And there's a line between two dots if they played a game together. And so now you can start um, really seeing people's behavior where that particular user, which is anonymous, but we can uniquely identify him, uh, is obviously a social hub where he pulled together a lot of his friends um, from the neighborhood. And maybe there's another cluster up there of other people that are playing. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we can now use this information to understand buying patterns. So when one person gets an expansion car, how quickly does it propagate to their friends? We can use it for marketing, as, uh, uh, for marketing where we can push notifications and promotions to that user knowing that he'll be a social hub and uh, tell his friends. We can um, uh, create events and tournaments and geo-target push notifications to get those players to come and play. Um, we can actually uh, use it for sales information where we can tell, on average, how long does it take a user to buy certain accessories after they've had the base set. And so this is a sort of information that we're trying to weave through every part of the company and influence manufacturing, influence sales, influence marketing, influence product, and influence engineering. Um, and it's a sort of analytical capability for a physical product that has rarely been possible outside of a of kind of a website or a social game where you truly understand everything that's happening. But that's exactly where we are at. And we can, for example, know that um, the AI for one particular car is slightly disproportionately better than the AI for another type of car. And because that AI wins 67% of the time on medium and the other one wins 61% of the time, we can start tuning and realize that, okay, the AI is better at using the shield than it is at using the tractor beam. So let's optimize that a little bit and make it fair again. So this is the way we're analyzing the game, and it's, um, it's really fun to be able to collect these statistics and be able to influence, um, uh, influence the product. Um, we know where people are playing the game. So um, we have our little bubble in San Francisco, um, LA, New York, DC, that's Chicago. We got Seattle and Vancouver, just decent, a few cities in Texas. Um, that's Mon Montreal up there, uh, Toronto. And so now we know where people are playing these games. So now we can focus marketing efforts. We can decide which retailers to go into, which retail stores of those retailers to go into. Um, if we want to have sales teams on the ground doing kind of guerrilla marketing demos, we know which markets we want to target. Um, and the funny thing is, is that we were on sale only in um, the U.S. and Canada, but somehow we had units smuggled to other parts of the world. And so, uh, so we have the uh, Brazil cohort. We have all over Europe. Um, we've had a knockoff Anki Drive homepage already appear in Russian. So that's maybe where the Moscow units came from. Uh, one of our employees spotted a Japanese businessman with an Anki Drive set, so maybe that one ended up in Japan. Um, Mexico City, for whatever reason, is a pretty huge hub. And so now um, we're getting these really great signals where we can decide which country should we expand to and what sequence. And uh, this is data that I think, um, you know, again, it, it's, I don't think anybody's really had this level of access to physical product usage other than like kind of mobile phones. Um, and the ways to use this, I think, are still... Um, you know, we're just scratching the surface even now. I think we're collecting all this data, but we've only just started to use it and actually analyze um, what's being done. Um, the other thing that makes it so powerful is that because we pushed all the complexity into the software side, every aspect of the gameplay is defined by software. So we can continually release new updates that create new capabilities and um, new gameplay modes, better AI, um, and more depth, where it doesn't matter whether you bought it in October or today or in six months, you'll have the latest experience. And so... Um, We've already done this um, several times, and so what happens is you update your app, 
the app actually updates the software on the cars and you have the latest experience because the hardware is robust. And so it's this attempt to turn the, turn the life cycle of hardware, which is typically 12, 18 months, and then it's obsolete and you have to buy the new version into one of software where we can continue to revamp the experience every month if we want to. So going into the software, um, there's a lot of software. And um, uh, one of the things that was kind of deceptive to me is just how much work it took to get from what we thought was a pretty advanced prototype to um, a, a actual mass producible functional product. And so uh, the other day, um, uh, maybe, like maybe a, a few months ago, Brad uh, Newman, one of the, uh, who's a, a PhD student here um, as well, he ran, um, uh, he ran an analysis on our Git repository to um, count blame lines and to see how many lines of code there were in the system. And this is what it looked like. So this was our history going back to, um, uh, to 2008, um, you know, cut off a little bit. And so for a while, um, it was just us three, so I was very heavily focused on the software. Um, uh, Hans was focused on electrical, mechanical, and so this includes the majority of the software that goes into the phone and the car. And then you see when we started kind of growing and hiring people, I still blame Kevin, Damian, and Brad stole most of my lines, and so that's why I started to decay. Um, but you kind of get, uh, get a sense for just how much had to happen from a point where we felt like we had a pretty solid technology demo to something that was actually a mass producible product. And so in terms of um, uh, breakdown, uh, Brad was working on the planning and AI, um, Diamond's game, uh, game engine and logic, which had to grow a lot once the gameplay came into the, in the view. Kevin was a lot of uh, um, the controls and localization systems and the logic on the car. Uh, Sean's game design and all those guys at the top are mobile and wireless where once we started developing for an iPhone and shifted away from a kind of dev environment off of a Ubuntu on a laptop, we had to put a lot of work into actually making the, um, uh, the uh, uh, UI, UX, um, the backend infrastructure, everything that goes into the phone side. And so um, uh, somebody might ask what happened over here, what's that little spike there? Um, uh, that was Brad commit, trying to commit boost to, uh, uh, to our software repository, trying to steal more lines. And so we made him take it back out again. So, so keep it fair. We don't let that kind of stuff slide. And so, um, <laughs> and so one of the other things that is really exciting about this is that um, over time, we hope that this becomes a, a better and better platform for other people to use. Because in effect, we've gotten it to a point where we're programming these characters to behave intelligently and to interact with each other. And so we hope other people will do that as well. And so we just released a, a, a very, very basic version of, of an SDK in January. Um, you can connect to it using uh, Bluetooth Low Energy uh, in a variety of modes. The cars are pretty inexpensive, and so uh, right now it's pretty basic. You can just give it uh, simple commands, but over time we're going to unlock more functionality, and hopefully it makes it easier and easier for people to try to um, program different types of AIs, make educational systems off of it. Um, it's something that we don't really have the cycles to push on really heavily right now, but hopefully this becomes a really great platform for education at some point in the future because uh, I think we all realize how physical systems um, connect with people in a much different way, especially kids, than, um, uh, than uh, just uh, you know, purely software systems. Okay, so that was a bit of a technology uh, deep dive, or not too deep, but just a, kind of a high level overview of where we're at. Um, I wanted to shift really quickly to design. So one of the other realizations that we had is that technology for technology's sake is not that necessarily that appealing. Um, you need to be able to have a product that is beautiful and intuitive and appealing um, for people to use. And we also knew that we were coming into a category which has a lot of bad stereotypes attached to it. Toys are stupid, cheap, they don't last more than 15 minutes, um, uh, they're plastic, and they're only for kids, and adults will never like them. And so we wanted to try to challenge that notion um, as we really tried to create this new category where you can have much higher price points because you have higher functionality. And so we, um, uh, we started working with a really famous designer in Hollywood named Harold Belker, who's um, a pretty fascinating character. So he does futuristic vehicles for Hollywood movies. He did all the vehicles in Minority Report, Total Recall. Uh, he designed an early version of the Batmobile and Tron light cycles. Um, the Iron Man face mask and uh, car. And so this is somebody who we met through an advisor of ours and he started working with us and he designed all of our cars. And originally he was a contractor and then he joined us um, full time about six months ago because apparently we're a lot nicer to work with than the movie industry folks. Um, he got, uh, his proudest achievement is he got chewed out by Steven Spielberg once um, even though he wasn't at fault. And uh, he's like, he, I, we asked him like, did you feel crappy about it? And he's just like, no, it was Steven Spielberg. He chewed me out. It was awesome. <laughs> so, so he's a fascinating guy. And so I wanted to share a really quick video um, 
that highlights the merger of design and mechanical engineering because uh, for movies and for a lot of products, the design stands on its own and you don't have any constraints. For something like what we're doing, there's really tight constraints between the mechanics and the design around it. And so Harold had to work really closely with our uh, really, really senior mechanical uh, engineer and really find a way to make this work. So. Apart, we are a robotics and artificial intelligence company, but we do fundamentally believe that good design is an integral part of what we have to do as a company. Design is actually extremely important for AI and robotics because humans have to interact with these robots. These are robotic cars. We want to make products that are surprising, that are engaging, that do things that you would never expect. And if we're going to do that on the product capability side, we wanted to make sure that the looks match that. We had an initial design direction for what we wanted the vehicles to look like. You know, we were looking for something that was futuristic, something that was very sleek, very sexy in some sense. The first time we met Harold, we had our stereotypes and uh, conceptions on what the Hollywood designer would look like. We imagined all sorts of things. I don't fit into the car side design. The guy's huge. He's just a... Uh, He's a huge, huge person. I started out as a uh, car designer. <laughs> six, six foot seven. I break into the entertainment industry. I spent the next 15 years designing vehicles for movies. And basically, because of all that, I was fortunate to be noticed by the people from Anki. The design brief said that we want to create autonomous race cars where a race takes place in the future, for example, 2030, and not just normal race cars, but race cars which include artificial intelligence and a lot of technology on the inside. How would something like that look? Go crazy. I think that's all he said. So let's go with that. We have to have as little as possible on the front tires, and most of the weight has to be on the rear tires. And I still had to deal with the fact that uh, the chassis was already predetermined. We did a lot of things I wouldn't normally do just to make his vision work. I raised the tail end of the car up by moving the motors from horizontal to more of an angle, and then narrowed the back of the car down, allowing him to have more range of freedom in the back. I really care about the skin and how well the car sits on the road, you know, and how do the reflections run. Does that front really go with the side with the back? I think it's successful if it feels like it's leaping forward while still standing there. We look over those cars and you can see which ones look faster, which ones look more armored, which ones look like as if they would carry more weapons. That's what we then use to create a personality on top of those forms. To me, that's always the trick to, to get that kind of passion from somebody who's all business and look at the cars and become a little boy. So funny story about Harold. Um, when he was in Germany um, working, I think it was either BMW or somewhere else, um, they were designing the first smart car. And the mandate on the smart car was that Harold would be able to fit into it. And so the smart car is literally a uh, bounding box around Harold Belker. That's, uh, that's, that's what, he, what he's like. It's, yeah, it's pretty incredible. The guy's just, just massive. Um, and so, but he really captured that, that sleek, sexy, futuristic style that we wanted. And so the characters resemble that. And this is our way of making a, a, what is in the end a toy, but one that doesn't look like it's made only for a six-year-old. It's something that all of us would find beautiful and appealing. And there are a lot of adults that like it as well. Parents that like to play with their kids, 50 year olds with no kids that want to play it because they're nostalgic for their slot car days. And it's one of the ways that you can really send the message that it is, uh, uh, this isn't what you expect. And it's also, also the reason why our packaging is more expensive than most toys retail for. It's, uh, it's all in this interest of, of uh, sending this uh, very clear signal that this isn't just something you find in, a, uh, in an aisle in Toys R Us. It's also the reason why we push so hard to launch with Apple, because that really helps us tell our story. Um, and so as, uh, as Matt mentioned, um, we had a really kind of unique honor um, in uh, the summer of last year uh, to launch our company during the keynote um, uh, during WWDC at Apple. And so that was uh, Brad and myself on stage where uh, Tim Cook introduced us uh, 10 minutes into his keynote, and we were able to, um, to share a little bit about what's possible with the technology that we were working on. And 
This is where um, strategically it was a pretty interesting decision on how to approach the PR angle of it. Because this was June and we weren't launching until September or October. Um, and so we didn't want to try to announce the product because frankly the product wasn't done yet. We didn't know what the gameplay was going to be exactly. There was a lot of work still to be done. And so we used this as an opportunity to tell the technology story and launch the company and put a lot of attention on this idea of robotics and AI coming into consumer products, um, get a lot of uh, credibility in tech and business news that then carried over into all of the consumer press that we got later in the season when we launched the, um, the product story. And so that was one of the really great lessons for us is, uh, is how well that worked, where if you really focus on, uh, on establishing credibility for the company, um, that ends up be, uh, paying off orders of magnitude when you talk to, um, uh, when you talk to consumer press, when you um, talk to retailers, when you talk to future investors. It's all part of this big vision because then you're not evaluated by just your product. You're evaluated by what it represents and how much further it could go in the next five, ten years. And so um, I, won't, uh, I won't go uh, play too much of this, but basically uh, we ran this... Um, demo on stage where the cars were driving around um, in choreography. Um, they, would, uh, uh, they would go into formations, uh, interact with each other. Um, what Apple cut out in their feed <laughs> afterwards is a little wireless glitch. I don't know how many of you guys saw it live, but uh, there was a wireless glitch where that uh, auditorium is one of the most hostile wireless environments that there is. That green light means it's disconnected. So everybody in the audience that saw that, that was part of the company, like their heart stopped because that's supposed to, that's supposed to be blue right there. Um, <laughs> I had no idea until I put it down. And then that, <laughs> and, uh, that part's cut out. So this right here is now, yeah, this is a skip forward where we did a really quick reset and luckily everything came alive and um, those guys. <laughs> Yeah, and so then, uh, and then he comes to life, he starts weaving through, they start blocking him, and, and in the end, um, we bring him to life with weapons where he actually takes them out one by one uh, in the environment. So this was something that really got people's attention because it's not something that was possible before. And then later on in the fall, uh, some uh, PR highlights that that helped us get. So um, we were uh, top toy of the year in Ellen. Um, uh, we were top 25 inventions in Time Magazine. Uh, that was not our doing in men's health. We had no idea what they were going to do. Um, <laughs> We, we just knew that they selected us and uh, there was some model involved. Um, and so we were in the tech, uh, entertainment gadgets um, uh, gift list and apparently we beat out PlayStation 4 and um, Xbox One for the number one spot on that list. Um, maybe we look better than an Xbox in that, that particular position. So um, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, and, uh, and so um, uh, the PR was very helpful um, and, and we ended up having a really great holiday season with Apple. Um, they partnered with us really deeply. We gave them an exclusive through the first holiday. Um, and they did something that they've never done before, which is uh, we had Apple sales associates actually demoing Anki Drive to customers during the holidays. And um, that's something that um, made a huge, huge difference because it's a, it's a product that's really hard to explain. But when you see the cars come to life and they interact, especially for kids, but also parents and grandparents, um, it's really experiential and that really helped tell the story. So it was a really good partnership at Apple and again, played into that broader goal of, um, of trying to separate ourselves from the traditional toy, uh, toy demographics. One of the things we're most proud of is the reviews ended up being really great. Um, people seemed to love it. There was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of diverse um, uh, interest of different age groups, um, male, female, uh, kids of all ages. Um, we had some really great stories where there was a, um, a family with an autistic child that was having social problems with their, um, uh, with, with their friends and, and he was becoming antisocial. Um, and he got an Anki drive set and loved it so much that he threw a birthday party and invited all his classmates, which he hadn't done in, a in like a year, a year and a half. And so the parents wrote us a really nice letter. Um, and then there were a few things that we, we didn't even expect. So we, this right here is a package that was sent by um, uh, a family of a six-year-old girl who whose yellow car, Cori, broke. But she didn't want to just get another yellow car. She wanted that particular car. And so she wrote a picture on the, on the box and basically asked for us to fix her yellow car and, uh, and send it back to her. And so this sort of kind of attachment that um, people started forming was, um, uh, was really great to see. And I think we're not even, 
we're, we're, we haven't even gotten 10% of the way to where we could. I think we could do a much better job than we have on really differentiating the characters and making them feel special and unique. Um, there's a lot of things that um, we planned to put in the first launch that we didn't because we ran out of time and we wanted to make sure that what we shipped was very, very high quality and we didn't try to push too much. But then since then we were able to expand a lot of the system. So this is a, a big update that we released in January that um, that's this uh, much deeper expansion of a progression system where you're able to customize your characters, get different weapons, different special abilities. Um, you earn upgrade points as you play, which you can spend on different elements of the car. Um, and as you upgrade your character, that stays on your character. He remembers it. It's not your device, it's the car. And so your level 12 um, uh, uh, row character is really truly different than your friend's row character that he just purchased that's maybe level two. And so it's another one of those elements that we try to um, embrace in order to um, amplify the individuality of these characters. And again, I think we've, we're learning a lot and I think we can still do a lot better, but um, early indications are that this is a really powerful aspect of what makes the game fun because you also create more of a challenge because you unlock um, new gameplay elements that you didn't have when you started just like you would in the video game. And so, um, I guess I wanted to finish with a few of the uh, lessons learned. Um, and there's way more lessons learned than this, but um, I'll start with, a, with uh, a list. I have a couple, two, couple of slides of these. So mass production is hard, um, the surprise. Uh, it's really, really hard. And uh, we got in some ways really lucky that we were able to ship on time because we had to solve some really open-ended problems in an incredibly expedited fashion. Um, and uh, that kind of ties us into the next part. It'll cost way more than you uh, think. So whatever you think it costs to launch a consumer product or to um, finance your company, it's a safe bet to just double it or maybe even more. You'll never regret it. Um, few people regret raising too much money. Um, a lot of people regret not raising enough money because the pain of not raising enough money is much worse. Um, the good news is, is that there are a lot of ways to finance development, especially if there's something that you're doing that's, um, that's somewhat unique using technologies that other people don't have access to. And so this points to um, the fundamental trade-off, um, schedule, quality, and cost. You want to raise more money so you can sacrifice cost in order to hit your schedule at the highest quality. And that's, in effect, what we did. The reason we printed in the US is because that's where we had the highest confidence level that, that the optics and traction properties and ink tricks that we needed to do would work really, really well. Um, it added cogs to the, the base set. Um, it made the margin smaller. But our priority in season one was to make sure it's a reliable and high quality product. So you want to raise more money so you can really sacrifice on that one. Um, if we started to sacrifice on quality, that would be unacceptable. And if we sacrificed on schedule and we slipped past the holiday season, that would be catastrophic because for a product like this, you're going to easily do half or more of your sales in the last six weeks of the year. And so um, the number one piece of advice is um, raise more money than you think you need. Um, and then... Um, be opportunistic about raising more because uh, your trade-off is basically diluting yourself by an extra few percentage points versus going out of business. So it's, uh, it's better to dilute yourself a little more. Um, the other one is hire really great people that are overqualified for what they need to do. Um, and the reason for that is that um, if you hire people for what you need them to do at this moment, then you'll constantly be playing this game of leapfrog where the company gets more complex and you've got to hire somebody else above them in order to scale. What you want to do is to hire somebody who will grow with the company for many, many years um, and it will be way more than capable of handling both the near term and the long term. And that really helped. We had a... We hired a head of QA that was um, managing 120 people and was doing a job solo for about six months. But now as we're growing, she's able to scale in a really good way. Our mechanical engineer was making crazy mass producible products in other companies and um, uh, at Logitech, but he was a perfect guy to help us in what we're doing. So that's something that um, the places that are scaling the best in the company are the ones where we really found the person that is overqualified for what we needed at the time that we hired them. Uh, the uh, technical challenges are important, but they're just one piece of the puzzle. In a lot of ways, um, you know, the, the technical challenges were really, really hard, but we had a really great handle on it because that was our expertise. And we, had, we found really great people from RI. I didn't mention, we have uh, 10 people at the company that graduated from Robotics Institute, um, both uh, masters and um, PhD, and uh, some in between. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and so, um, 
that gives us a really solid base on the technical side. We had to learn a lot on the gameplay, game design, UI, UX, um, marketing, manufacturing, sales, channel strategy. Um, and this was really challenging. So one of the mistakes that we made was, um, and it's not a binary thing, but something we could have done better is on the marketing side. I think we, we, we did a, we were almost flawless in the company launch. We couldn't have done better in terms of how we launched at WWDC, the sort of PR and conversations we had as a result. It really like, catapulted us to a really great position. Um, it was actually really challenging to then make that pivot to the product launch and truly explain um, to people what it is that makes this product special and how it's different um, and how to convey that level of excitement without showing a demo because a demo doesn't scale. Um, and so it's easy for us to kind of take for granted the things that are intuitive to us, they may not be intuitive to others. And so right now, one of the things that we're doing is, um, uh, is optimizing some of the things that we feel we could have done better on the product video, on the packaging, on the website, on the point of sale, um, to really tell that message in a better way. So truly, one of the things that feels completely obvious in hindsight, but our old product video, is beautiful, it's mystical, it has all these like amazing cars that are rendered, but you could mistaken it for a video game because it doesn't clobber you over the head and explain that this is a physical game and that there's people physically playing it. And it's one of those things that we thought would be pretty obvious because you're seeing a box in front of you on a shelf, but at the end of the day, it wasn't so obvious. The other misconception that kind of really blew me away was that um, for about a month to month and a half after launch, at least 30% of Apple sales associates thought that this was a game that you can't actually play. You just watch the cars drive around. And, <laughs> and they, they, they're intelligent and they, like, they have AI and they're super smart, um, which we thought that would be the harder message. But because of WWDC, there was this misconception that you don't actually control a car yourself and that you're just watching this uh, thing unfold. And so we had to work like crazy to like, educate all the sales associates and to really drive that home that no, you, know, you get to play as well, and there's intelli really, really intelligent cars. So it's little things like that which you can really easily take for granted. Um, find the right investors. Uh, not all money is the same. Um, you, you need the money, but more than anything, you need an investor that is in line with you on your long-term vision. We, we, we did really well on this front where um, we partnered with um, a couple of really great firms. Our Series A was Andreessen Horowitz, um, and then uh, Index Ventures came in in our Series B. And these are both firms that have a really long-term vision. They're not looking for a quick flip. There were companies that, or uh, venture firms that we talked to in 2012 that were t asking us, why don't you just launch this here? Put out a beta and, um, uh, in, uh, in the holiday like one year earlier and just you know, let the, get feedback and then iterate. And that's a horrible piece of advice because like, especially when you're selling a, um, an expensive hardware product, your customer's not your beta tester. Your beta testers are your beta testers. And so um, we wanted somebody that was really in line with that long-term vision and also had a really deep value add in the expertise that we, need, we felt like we needed to supplement ourselves. Um, Overinvest in PR. Um, it's probably the um, best um, ROI um, for marketing that you can get but then don't neglect actual marketing itself. So you gotta follow it up, and you gotta have awareness and make sure that people understand what your product is and that it's out there. Um, because there's, um, it's kind of scary to, um, to look around, especially like now that we're kind of close to it, at the, the sort of companies in Silicon Valley that had incredible technologies that are in a graveyard because nobody knew about them. And in the end, technology on its own doesn't sell, doesn't sell products. Um, customer service. Um, Overinvest in customer service. That was our number one uh, uh, line of defense that if anything went wrong where we had isolated logistics issues, um, we had a, a, a small uh, pocket of, um, uh, of, of base sets that didn't get kitted correctly where um, uh, a few dozen customers um, were sent tracks uh, without, uh, uh, sent base sets without tracks, which is not good. Um, and so they opened up and there's a hole. And so, you know, we overnighted uh, a bunch of tracks to them to like kind of catch up to those units. But like in the end, when somebody calls customer support, if you have an incredible customer support team, a customer that was, had a problem and was pissed off but was helped in a really good way is way more loyal of a customer than one that never had a problem at all. And that was, I'm so happy that we had an incredible customer, head of customer support where we invested a lot of money. We had it in-house, especially for the first holiday season and we were very hands-on. And a lot of those five-star reviews um, were actually, um, not a lot of them, but probably at least like three or four of them were actually people that had some sort of a problem or didn't understand something, but then were helped by customer support and it was made better. And uh, 
yeah, it's just the easiest way to get really loyal um, fans. So it's, it's really worth um, saving the money and investing well. Choose your co-founders wisely. That one's obvious. Um, you got to find people you trust and get along with. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time together. You'll disagree. You'll have to um, uh, diversify on what you work on. Um, you'll have to trust that they'll do a good job because it becomes impossible to scale. Um, and if you have any sort of tensions or mistrusts or don't have the same goal in mind, you're going to have really big problems. And that, that's probably one of them. I'd say it's, it's, um, that's probably the most common reason for a startup uh, to fail in the early stages where there's just a fundamental disagreement between the core team and then you can't, you can't go on. So I've been uh, really lucky where Hans, Mark, and I have worked really well together and, um, and been very complimentary in terms of both interests and expertise. Um, you got to scale. So we, we were two years ago, we were four people. We're 70 now at Anki. So we, uh, uh, we grew a lot in the last year, especially where um, the sort of roles that each of us have at the company is so different than it was a year and a half ago. Um, and so the things that we used to be really deeply involved in, um, we can't be involved in anymore. Uh, I, I don't get to write code anymore, and it's really sad. And uh, when I hit the one-year anniversary of when I like, last wrote a line of code, all the engineers made a cake with a, uh, with a chain set and icing on it. It was my last commit to celebrate my, uh, my, my final purge from the, uh, from the repository. Um, that is something that's, you know, it's funny, but it's kind of hard because like you go from being the owner of every piece of the system and every piece of the company to having to let go of every piece of the company. And if you don't let go and replace yourself, you're going to have a lot of problem at every single future stage. And so that's, um, it's probably one of the best lessons um, that I've had where I've personally felt like every time I caught up to that, the rules of the game changed and it got even harder. And so um, proactively thinking about how can you make yourself irrelevant in every piece that you can is the most important thing to, to being able to scale with a company because instead of going deep in everything you go, uh, or being deep in one thing, you have to be broad in everything and you can't go deep in any, any particular thing. Um, and then the final one is that uh, graduate school really was worth it. Um, all of the things that we're doing, um, none of it, uh, we could have done without the really unique knowledge and uh, the relationships and this, uh, the, um, uh, the people that we've met here, um, both, from a, um, both from a thought process standpoint where in a lot of ways solving that problem and thinking about how we, like, we approach it was not too far off from the thought process of solving a research problem where there's no obvious answer, there's no um, trajectory where you're guaranteed to get to an outcome. Um, but... Uh, yeah, the patience of getting through a thesis is a pretty good, uh, a pretty good primer for the patience to get through some of the problems in a company. Um, and, I, and I think like one of the most valuable things is I'm really happy that we're working on something that is not a company that 20 people are doing where you're just competing and trying to shout louder, but it's something that really feels unique and our bigger challenge is optimizing it and telling the story and being able to educate customers about it. Um, that's really satisfying. I think that's only possible if you end up having the foundation be something that is very specialized like robotics and AI um, or you know, any other specialty. Um, and it becomes very difficult for another company to replicate it in six months. And um, I'm really happy with the fact that we have both that and we have really te uh, technically challenging problems, but at the same time, it feels like it has the potential to be a really good business um, as well. And so we have a long ways to go, um, but it was a pretty good start. Um, we had a good holiday season and now we're scrambling to optimize the product, optimize the marketing, figure out the new channels. We're thinking about international. Um, we're um, continuing to figure out how to grow, how to paralyze between a second product line um, and, uh, and the first, and um, to become much more efficient in how we make decisions. So it's, uh, there's always a challenge, but um, uh, yeah, best experience I've ever had, um, for sure. Um, so I, uh, I think that pretty much covers my core lessons learned. There's, there's a lot more um, kind of behind the scenes. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, I'll end with a video of us just goofing around. We're, um, we, were, we made a super huge track and put on, I think, 130 cars simultaneously um, at night just to see what would happen. Um, no, no real purpose here, just to, uh, just, just to share. But um, I'll end with this, and um, if there's any questions, I'd be really happy to answer or discuss. <laughs> yeah, questions. That's what you can do with the SDK. It'll cost a lot. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. So um, um, I don't know how, how deep you can go with the SDK, and I wonder if people uh, are worrying about hacking into your software so that 
they can give themselves a little bit of an advantage uh, when they're playing with their friends. It's already happened. Um, yeah. There's a guy in uh, Florida, there's this uh, um, guy who just loves hacking reverse engineering stuff. He already reverse engineered our protocol from our last version where you can give your car upgrades um, without actually earning them. And, um, and so every version we release, we have to kind of like add more security to it. And at some point, we'll actually do some sort of encryption because right now it's just an open message that, that does that. I could send him my cars and he could upgrade them. That's right. What's the address? I wouldn't want to ask him. So funny thing is, he actually started taunting me on Twitter. So he, uh, he, he, he connected on Twitter and, uh, and then he said, I have a special surprise for you um, in the app board. So why don't you uh, try it in your office? And, um, and apparently... Uh, we'd already announced that the first four cars were in circulation. The fifth car is Corax, which hadn't been released yet. And it's kind of the specialty character, which is like the most aggressive one in the game. But um, he made it so that his app, if it saw Corax, it would pop up a special message that would just like personally taunt me. And he knew that in the office we had tons of these Coraxes. And so, yeah, so this guy has been, um, uh, but it's really funny because we kind of embraced him and we invited him to the office to, um, uh, uh, to kind of check out what we're doing. And now he's kind of become a huge fan where even though he's, Kind of a pain and keeps hacking, uh, trying to hack our stuff. Um, that's exactly the sort of like uh, really, um, uh, a really excited crowd that you want. Yeah. So when it comes to the SDK, by the way, um, you know we're putting pretty limited cycles into it. But if people have uh, really specific requests on what they want, um, it's uh, hopefully within a reasonable amount of time. Um, it's something that becomes uh, passes the bar of being interesting and usable for a project or for something fun. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So now that you. Because <laughs> the hardware you can't change. Um, so we were, uh, a majority of the hardware actually ended up being really fantastic. Like the cars, um, we wanted to make sure that it captured everything we wanted to do in terms of basic capabilities, driving, steering, lights, those sorts of things. Um, the nice thing is, is that anything that we want to add, that could be a new character, where if we want to have a character that does something special, that has like an extra add-on or different types of like lights or different size, that can be a completely different character which doesn't make the previous one obsolete. Um, I think we learned a lot of things on uh, the track where I think there's some things we would have done differently on the track. Um, a little bit in the process where we, we found some really interesting ways we could have printed afterwards after the fact which we might use um, in future methods. Um, the other one is that we had to finalize the art on the track well before we shipped the product. And we realized only after the fact that we should have included more elements on the track that were artwork, which could then be brought to life in the gameplay itself. So we have like a starting line, which now the cars can actually use that in the game, even though they don't see the starting line, the game knows exactly where it is. Likewise, we could have used kind of power up locations and, uh, and so forth. And so we're learning elements of um, what we could have done a little bit better, but that's the reason why we're trying to push as much as we can into the software, because on the software, um, we've truly kind of revamped the experience where the amount of functionality is already so far beyond what we had before, and we're about to um, push another really big update very soon. Yes? Uh, uh, the probability of a human car winning against the AI on hard. So uh, it's really low. Matt, have you played against the AI on hard? Uh, uh, I don't, I've never been good enough to play against AI hard. Uh, it wins a vast, vast majority of the time, like well over like 95% or so. Um, and so there is a, I only know one person that has ever beaten three AI cars on hard simultaneously, and that's our tester in the office who uh, plays more than any human alive. And so he's uh, at, a, at a company party. We had a public exhibit where he played against three AI cars on hard, and we said that if he beat all of them, we would donate 500 bucks to charity. And so he had like pressure on him to, uh, to deliver. Um, but it's really hard, but the neat thing is, is that we don't cheat at all. It's just truly optimal in terms of how it thinks about what to do. And so you literally see it kind of like hit the brakes in order to sneak up behind you and kind of stalk you and stay out of your line of fire. And especially when you have three or four players in the game, there's so many permutations that it's hard for you to think about. But in terms of the AI, um, it figures it out. What we're actually using, so some of you guys might be interested in this, we're using Anytime A-Star, kind of a slight variation of it, where um, uh, it is a four-dimensional search um, where the dimensions are horizontal position, forward distance driven, speed, and time. And so it's actually thinking about where all the characters are in motion will be at any given point in time, and it's using that in order to position itself somewhere in the future in order to drop 
stop a landmine, ram you, shoot you, avoid you, whatever it is that it wants to do. And then that becomes the engine for every one of the weapons and special abilities that it tries to use. And it's also a way where we can um, program personalities. So if a character is uh, really aggressive, then its relative uh, weight for um, getting, a, getting a kill versus getting shot is skewed in one direction. Whereas if it's passive, maybe there's bigger penalty regions on kind of car, other cars. There's a, more of a penalty region and, uh, to being kind of in a vulnerable position. And so all of these things become kind of knobs that can skew um, how we can define a personality of a car, which is kind of really fun to see. And sometimes you, you get these immersive behaviors that surprise you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Could you talk a little more about your relationship with your investors? Yeah. And I mean, how you met them or, or what your interaction is with them? Absolutely. So, um, our, uh, so our two firms, Andreessen Horowitz and Index, we also had a, uh, a seed round where it was a combination of some friends and family and then a quantitative hedge fund in New York that was the lead, um, where the founder was a PhD in robotics from MIT. So it was a personal kind of, kind of uh, uh, connection there. Um, and so our first investor was Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, we met them through a friend of mine uh, from undergrad. Um, and their thesis is software eats the world. Software eats every industry that's out there. And in this particular case, even though it's hardware, it's software. And here it's software eating entertainment or eating toys. And so it fit the thesis really perfectly. And it was completely in line with how they thought about um, what, uh, everything from social to um, uh, search to um, uh, you know, data analytics to everything across the board, uh, healthcare. It was all about software being the core component of, of what's done. And so that was a really great connection. And so Mark Andreessen um, uh, joined our board when we were four people, which is kind of humbling because he's, uh, uh, he, you know, he's somebody who's, um, uh, you know, his, his biggest limitation is time, given the other things that he has going on. Um, and that was a really special firm and a perfect example of how the investors can provide a big value add, um, where the way they're structured is they have like six or seven general partners and about 60, now 80, internal partners whose full-time job is to support the portfolio. And so they had people who are experts and focused only on technical recruiting, on executive recruiting, on compensation, on business development and getting connections to any company that you would ever want to in the world, on banking, um, on uh, uh, you know, kind of culture and HR, um, anything you, would, you could ever imagine. And so we were able to make use of this like really ama amazing network of people and avoid making some mistakes early on that would have been really painful to fix. Like how do you compensate? people at different stages in the company. They had a massive pool of statistics across Silicon Valley and across different points in time and different amounts raised that helped us be really methodical in that front. Um, so they were fantastic and then our board members were there for um, strategic elements. But the funny thing is, is that um, we would always know who to go to for a particular case. So somebody squatting on our Twitter uh, handle Anki um, you're not going to go to Mark Andreessen to complain about that, but there's a guy inside the firm who knows the VP of product at Twitter who boots the squatter and then you get the, the handle. And so it's like, you know, I, that, it's really helpful to be able to do that sort of thing. Um, and then um, our, our Series B investors came in just before WWDC Index Ventures. They're more, um, they're based out of uh, Geneva, London, and they have a San Francisco office. Um, they were introduced by a really uh, close advisor of ours uh, that's... Um, uh, in the entertainment industry who also introduced us to Harold actually. Um, and they, they were an amazing fit because um, they're very helpful with us thinking about how to go into Europe um, and uh, they have a much more kind of global thought process and reach. And the most important thing is that uh, psychologically everybody was aligned. There was a very long-term vision. They were, they were, not, um, they were not pressured to, to flip the company in the next two years. Um, they're only interested if uh, the company's a massive, massive success and a massive impact. A 2x return doesn't move the needle for them. And so that was a really good alignment because then um, you're able to, uh, you don't have to overfit or optimize locally for any sort of um, kind of weird personal, um, uh, personal incentives that they might have. Yeah, and uh, yeah, happy to go into more detail you know, as well. But um, yeah, the, the way I work with them is I try to be really open. Um, we have really constructive board meetings. Um, uh, I interact with them intermediately if uh, there's anything that's of relevance. Um, and then I, uh, we've always tried to make really deep use of their internal networks. Um, that's how we got connected at Apple. It was, uh, it was Mar Mark Andreessen kind of making that connection where we ended up doing a presentation in front of uh, half of Apple's executive team, which was kind of incredible. And, that's the sort of thing that wouldn't happen if you're just you know, get, getting uh, money from somebody with, with little value add. There's a saying that um, 
you know, out of all investors you can get, um, you're lucky if they don't add negative value. Um, and I think it's, it's probably true. So I'd say like um, there's maybe a, you know, four, uh, half that add, uh, 40 to 50 percent that add negative value, just anecdotally speaking from like kind of polling people uh, around us, maybe uh, 30 percent that are neutral. And then, you know, maybe a minority like 20 percent actually add really significant positive value. And I think we've been really lucky that um, we've been able to work with great people along the way. Yes. What is the software difference between different difficulties of a AI? Mm -hmm. uh, it is, uh, so it's all in the phone. Um, the cars, by the way, mechanically are identical except for the shell. It's a software that tells them who they are and how they behave. Um, the, uh, the difference in the AI is how responsive they are to your motions, how deeply they'll search to try to find a good solution, how fast their reflexes are, um, and how aggressive uh, and accurate they'll be at using their weapons and items. And so it's a combination of a lot of kind of different features um, that end up making it more difficult to hit them, make them more aggressive at, at hitting you and just how sneaky of combinations they'll, they'll use. Um, but uh, yeah, the interesting thing is that we've really approached it as a robotics problem where it's a, kind of a deep search in this uh, uh, space of possibilities. Um, and, uh, and then the knobs that end up being exposed are ways that you can uh, set difficulty, personality, um, style for a particular weapon or item and so forth. Yes. Yeah, so for uh, probably a year and a half, um, uh, I was already working on the um, localization and path planning and kind of world state without any physical prototypes um, while Hans was building, you know, iterations of kind of mechanical, uh, uh, the mechanical and electrical systems to be able to just like drive and follow a very simple trajectory. Um, and so there was just this assumption that we, we, we architected the system ahead of time that here's the modules and how they would snap together. And there was just an assumption that it will work and come together. And, um, <laughs> and it kind of did, uh, it was weird. So um, uh, you know, every piece was designed independently, but in a very uh, logical way on how it snapped together. So for example, like um, Hans would design the mechanics and motors to be able to kind of like, you know, iterate a move and be able to use a controller to follow a trajectory. Then I worked on, a, the parsing system on the optical sensor, which was originally kind of like a linear scanner, like a fingerprint reader. So funny thing is, is that a 102 pixel linear scanner costs $6 and a 640 by 480 with way more capabilities costs $1. That's like what happens when you use a, uh, like a component that's kind of been driven by a cell phone industry. And so I would sit there and develop the software for the localization system and how it would parse and interpret that information um, and the sort of messages it would send back with the assumption that the other end of it would receive those messages and know what they meant, even though they never actually talked together until much later. And so about a year and a half um, in, or uh, maybe a tiny bit less than that, we had our first car that was driving around in a circle on a track, and there was a virtual representation where the car was actually visible and matching what was happening. That was really, really exciting. And, and it, yeah, it was like 30 centimeters a second, which we, saw, we thought was blazing fast and we'd never need to go faster. And it's like, it was horrendously slow. And so, you know, right now the cars can go um, uh, over two meters a second um, at the max, uh, um, you know, with full upgrades and everything. And so that was the other thing is that we realized that we tried to kind of jump the gun and start thinking about gameplay, where until we had the, a good understanding of what the raw capabilities were, it's impossible to actually end, uh, think about the gameplay because gameplay with 30 centimeter a second cars is <laughs> very different than if you actually have that um, uh, flexibility. I mean, the other realization is that um, even when they connected at a base level, these are pieces that are never done. And so you guys all know that like when you do like path planning or AI, it's never really done, it's just better than it used to be. And so um, there are a lot of things that are better than they used to be in the system. And then you play whack-a-mole where like the controls are great until they're not. And then the localization is great until it's not. And then the planning is great until it's not. And then you kind of beat them down one at a time and you have to kind of keep revisiting it. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's the difference between robotics and software, I guess, uh, traditionally. But, um, uh, but I, it, it helped a lot to just try to really carve out these boundaries and think about it very discreetly on what are the pieces they need to work together to make it happen. So smooth when they move. Yeah, and that's, uh, and, and so literally like they're um, uh, following a line that's virtualized at any point, that's why they can move. And 500 times a second, they're sensing what that deviation is from the exact target down to like tiny fractions of a millimeter and making adjustments on the rear wheels. And so if you pick up a track and give it like a 30 degree angle, it'll still follow that trajectory because um, 
it just senses that even greater deviation and fights even harder to adjust for it. And that's the thing, that's the thing where having that software that's over the top robust is actually necessary because if you think about the motors that we're using, they're fairly inexpensive motors that you would use for kind of vibration in a phone or just very simple applications. And so they vary um, in terms of their characteristics. They vary in how they degrade over time. Um, they vary in like uh, kind of their output profile. And so having that very robust software is what lets you use much cheaper hardware and also kind of deal with uh, variations in dust and all the other things that can happen. Yes. Let's see, what seems to fail? Um, so, well, okay, so part of it's gameplay, where um, we're constantly pushing to keep the retention higher. So one of the things we're realizing is that um, some people don't even realize you can uh, upgrade the cars. And so one of the things that we're thinking about how to do is how to like hold their hand through their first kind of upgrade, because we know from our statistics that once a person upgrades their cars, there's a much higher percentage chance that they're going to be hooked and play for much longer than they would otherwise. So I think that was kind of like a game design failure a little bit where we can adjust and become much more, uh, have kind of more missions and more um, kind of structure to, um, uh, to what the campaign is instead of just a game that you play over and over again. Um, mechanically, the cars are actually really fantastic. I think we have some variability in the, uh, uh, we had some software variability that caused cars to, um, uh, to behave in slightly different ways when um, there was like extreme dust or uh, dirt on the track. And so that's another thing that I, from a previous release, we did a really big update where cars are now fighting much harder to stay on the track and we see data from much more variety of environments and are able to optimi optimize for that. Um, we've had uh, localization issues that we fixed where um, it was a modeling um, problem or just imperfection where uh, we realized that um, uh, you know, the, uh, we were modeling something the cars were doing, which we obviously realized afterwards that they couldn't do, and so then we adjusted uh, kind of the perfection there. And then we had balance issues, which we fixed in software, um, where the AI was disproportionately good with one car than the other, not by massive amount, but noticeable. Um, and, uh, and that cars were favoring one type of weapon over another. And so these are all things that we're iterating on. And again, we're trying to push them into the software side because it's better to make a mistake in software than to make a mistake in hardware. Um, if you make a mistake in hardware, it could be catastrophic. So um, we, uh, uh, we tried to, you know, we literally, our full working prototype that was equivalent to what we wanted to mass produce, we had that ready like 10 or 11 months before launch. And then it was the iterations in the mass production process that took the next six months to really get right. And um, uh, where a fully working prototype, we, uh, you would realize that like, this wall cavity is too thin and it tends to break on a drop this percentage of the time. And so not because you need it for functionality, but because you need it for robustness, you need to then make iterations. And so we'd have a lot of intermediate failures which we'd fix before we actually launched the product. This last question. Yeah. Hey. Okay, you may not want to, I have two questions, you may not want to answer them. How many units have you guys pushed? Uh, can't answer that one yet. <laughs> do you expect it to, do you expect to sell more this next Christmas than you did the last Christmas? Oh, absolutely. I, I really hope so. I mean, the truth is, that, um, so we, were, we did really well at Apple. It was a, a like, really, really good result, but Apple only has 280 stores. So just to put it into perspective, I think um, there's an assumption that Apple is like this absolute juggernaut, but when you have 280 stores in all of North America, you are not hitting um, a, a decent percentage of the population. And so even Apple sells, I think, like 70% of their products outside of their own uh, stores. And so for us, it was a you know, we weren't even on Amazon in the first season, which was actually a pretty big sacrifice. Um, but it was a conscious investment to give up volume in order to really establish that brand and credibility, which is now helping us with a lot of other retailers that we're opening up with um, to do really unusual things that we wouldn't have done otherwise if we just opened up on Amazon and Toys R Us or something like that. So um, the goal is absolutely to do much better this holiday than last holiday, um, both because the product will be better, uh, will be in more places. Um, hopefully the awareness is something that we can really optimize and, and be better about. And frankly, um, you know, I, we still have a lot of work to do because I think we, we over-indexed in the kind of tech early adopter kind of Apple enthusiast crowd. And I think we, uh, we left some low-hanging fruit um, that we could have really gotten on the um, you know, uh, kids, family gamers, more lifestyle uh, kind of toy video game side of it, where there's overlap, 
but we didn't do any marketing directly at kids. And this is something that in the end, we know that, that kids, kind of boys, six to 12 especially, are kind of like the prime demographic for the end user. And so um, in these optimizations, hopefully we can be much more efficient with the marketing message. But um, yeah, the goal is to, to grow by a pretty good amount because we were only in season for 10 weeks last year as well. And then you also said something about parallel products. Yeah. That's three. Oh, that's one. Um, So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we, we're, we've already been working in parallel on not just extensions of this one, but also a second product. And can't talk about specifics, but abstractly, the thing that is really important to us is that every single thing that we work on in the company uh, for any product isn't just a one-off effort, but it's a core piece of technology that we can reuse for future products. And so in some sense, that raises a foundation where we can do more and more ambitious things with products two, three, four, and beyond that would never be possible as a first product. And so a great example is the wireless communications. That was so hard to get right where we were finding bugs in Apple's Bluetooth stack that like, that they didn't even know existed and like having to work with them to fix it because nobody had ever done this sort of real-time multi-node communication before. But now we have this beautiful library that we can use in other products. Same thing with the back-end infrastructure, same thing with the positioning systems where even if you think about drive uh, as the game, it's less about race cars and more about physical characters understanding their environment and then using software to bring them to life. And so these become then kind of robust tools where you can start opening your mind and thinking about how now that I have 40% of this product, next product done, how can I be even more ambitious on what the new pieces are that I need to add because we already have not just the technical pieces but manufacturing expertise, brand for the company, um, you know, the people expertise and just kind of all the strategies and retail relationships. It just becomes easier if you can paralyze those efforts. Yeah. Thank you very much, Morris. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you. Yep.